rigor versus relevance, explanation versus experience, and isolated versus integrated thinking. Greetings from Switzerland. My name is Jyoti Guptara. I'm a novelist, a business storytelling consultant and executive coach. And I want to thank Professor Agarwal for inviting me to share some ideas on the role of storytelling in the future of business education. And thank you esteemed colleagues for your kind attention. I'm sorry not to be with you in person today. As we're speaking, I should be attending a wedding if all goes well crossing the border. Now, you may ask, what is a business storytelling consultant? Well, you know how some people have a brilliant idea or product, but they struggle to get their message across. Well, I help people with that problem tell stories so that people listen. Now, as you know, business storytelling can be applied in many different ways and in different arenas. We can apply it externally in marketing and sales for pitches and presentations, branding and the like. Uh, to build relationships with stakeholders. Or we can apply it internally to inculcate values, uh, all sorts of internal communications, be that change management or uh, implementing strategy. And then there's a third area, which I find personally very gratifying, which is the area of reframing your own narrative. So uh, you could say self-help or self-development. Um, you know, what is the story that you tell about yourself or the story that you tell yourself about your business or about the world and how it works? So there are these three different areas. And I think there's a lot of potential uh, room for improvement when it comes to how business schools in particular um, teach storytelling in these three areas. And uh, that's why I'm delighted that storytelling features so prominently in the conference topic. Now, I'm giving my talk the title Three Key Challenges for Business Education and How Storytelling Overcomes Them. What are these three challenges? Well, firstly, rigor versus relevance, which I'm sure is a familiar tension to many of you in academia. Secondly, explanation versus experience. So you can explain something and maybe even understand it, but that is a far cry from putting it into practice. And the third challenge I want to talk about today is isolated versus integrated thinking. So you can call that silification, compartmentalization, fragmentalism, uh, you know, this sort of fragmented approach uh, to doing life and business. And I think, um, well, first of all, to recap again, rigor versus relevance, explanation versus experience, and isolated versus integrated thinking. And I think to the extent that business education is unable to address these challenges or insufficiently address these tensions, I think the pie will be eaten away by the burgeoning industry of self-education. But who am I to talk about such lofty concerns? I, unlike some of you, am not a professor of management. In fact, I left school when I was 15 years old. I dropped out to become a full-time writer and later became a business storytelling consultant. It was when I was invited to a UN partner organization as one of their executives in residence, actually as their novelist in residence, that uh, this idea of business storytelling really came alive to me. Before that, I thought that business storytelling was, you know, just sort of window dressing, something to make otherwise boring content a little bit more entertaining. But while I was in Geneva, um, we had very eminent individuals, ambassadors, generals, CEOs on sabbatical. These were obviously brilliant people, but I found them often more interesting and their content more relevant not during their presentation, but in between and after their official teaching over coffee breaks and at lunch. Why? Because that's when they were really human and they would tell stories about their experience. So I started telling them, hey, this story you've just shared, why don't you start your next presentation with that story? And it'll give an entirely different context for everything that you shared. 
And that's what they started doing. So um, I started contributing to the executive education of that institute. Um, now, as I mentioned, I'm a novelist. That's my background in storytelling. But I recently released my first nonfiction book, Business Storytelling from Hype to Hack. And I think the title is quite relevant for today's topic because we know in business that storytelling is powerful. We know we should be using it, but we struggle with the implementation, with the how. And that's what this book really um, tries to do. It tries to give us a series of hacks to hacking storytelling. So I posit that storytelling is a communications hack. And in this book, I dive into seven different areas, such as communicating strategy or personal development and um, how you can hack that particular area with storytelling. But then I'll also give keys to hacking storytelling itself, which is your communications hack. So diving into today's topic, recently the former dean of a top business school in Canada said that business schools have a big problem. Why? Well, he said that business schools do not teach the fundamental problems of business. So this is strong medicine. And uh, in my talk today, I hope to address three of the tensions as to why that is the case. First of all, rigor versus relevance. In academia, relevance um, and rigor are often at odds. What do I mean by that? Well, we want academia to be rigorous. We want it to be truthful. We want it to be factual. Um, and the question becomes for many of us, uh, especially the practitioners then, is well, how much of that can I put into practice? So it's the tension between following procedures. Uh, as an example, a bibliographical search. You, you have um, to, first of all, find out what has been written on this subject by other people in the field. And of course, that's a very important um, part of academia and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you spend six months reading what other people have written, um, what's happening to your company, if you happen to be in business as well at the same time, then in those six months of you finding all sorts of wonderful ideas and, and being very academically rigorous, your company might be going down the drain. That's on the negative side. Or on the positive side, you might be missing out on incredible opportunities while your competitors are eating up your cake. The experience of a professor of management really brings this point home. Professor Howard Rafer is a statistician and a mathematician. Uh, he taught at biz uh, Harvard Business School. And Professor Rafer was known as an expert on decision making. And as a very eminent and successful individual, a lot of, he got a lot of offers from different business schools. And one day he gets a very attractive offer from Stanford and he can't make up his mind. So he goes to the Dean of Harvard Business School and says, look, I've just received this amazing offer and I can't make up my mind. And the Dean goes, Howard, you're a decision-making expert. This is a decision. Who on this green earth is better qualified to make this decision than you? Howard, why don't you apply one of your models to yourself? And Professor Reefer responds, yeah, but this is serious. <laughs> so here we have the world's foremost decision-making expert hesitant to apply his own model to one of his important life decisions. And I love how this really illustrates the real life tension between rigor and relevance in academia. See, much of academia is abstract. And um, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves in business education is, does the advantage outweigh the time and effort spent in being so rigorous? Now, case studies are one method that is supposed to overcome this challenge and ensure relevance, but it's really a different ball game from storytelling if you receive a 500 page case study uh, to debate. So the question remains, how do you apply that in real life? It's considered mental training, yes, and, and it is very good mental training. Um, but we have to understand that classroom debate is a very different circumstance, very different than when you have skin in the game and there are real costs 
to those decisions and those debates. Now, if a Harvard professor struggles um, to see the relevance with his own model, you can bet that Harvard MBAs do too. Moving on to our second point, explanation versus experience, or you could say theory versus practice. Now, we know that managers tend to make their decisions on the basis of their experience. They can balance the theory that they're learning with the experience that they've had in business, which is why some top business schools, such as INSEAD, don't actually let you pursue a graduate degree without a few years of practical experience in business. Now, we can't all experience everything, right? Which is why we have teaching. Now, if you are unable to experience something firsthand, what is the next best thing? It's a story. Why is a story the next best thing to real life experience? Well, it's because at a subconscious level, we cannot fully differentiate between the real and the imagined. So if we hear a story, then we experience what is being shared with us in that story vicariously. So imagine that you're sitting on your sofa and you're enjoying popcorn and you're having a nice hot drink. You're very comfortable, but part of you thinks you're actually being chased by a murderer because that's what you're watching on the television, right? So your heart is racing and you're sweating and you're shaking because at a subconscious level, we think we are participating in that story. And this has all sorts of wonderful applications for management, for example. Rather than just telling somebody how to behave, you can model behavior with a story. Now, some people will object to anecdotal evidence and they'll say you shouldn't be giving individual stories. We should be aggregating stories. And that's what we call statistics. Well, yes, that's correct in theory. But as we know, we human beings are not nearly as rational as we like to believe. And we don't always follow the theory. We tend to make decisions, first of all, emotionally, and then we justify the decision we've already taken after the fact with rational argument. Um, a case in point is a study that was conducted in 2009, the Significant Object Study. So we had 100 researchers, uh, sorry, 100 writers were given the task by researchers to buy sort of secondhand junk, you know, any old, um, some people's trash, for $1.25 on eBay. And these 100 writers were asked to write a little story, just make up something, and put the same item back up on eBay and see what happens. Now, what had sold for a combined value of $125 without a story, when put back up on eBay with the story, now sold for guess how much? Over $3,600. So that's over 28 times the value multiplication. Uh, some objects only doubled, but that's already amazing, isn't it? And other objects sold for 100 times their original value. So that study really demonstrates how stories can raise the perceived value of an idea or a product. And we need to be making use of this as we teach business education and any kind of education for that fact. Moving on to my third point, isolated versus integrated thinking or fragmentation. Coming back to the dean who said that business schools have a big problem, they don't teach the fundamental problems of business. He went on to say they teach finance and then they teach marketing and they teach human resources. But as the greatest management thinker of all time, Peter Drucker said, there are no marketing problems. There are no accounting problems. There are only business problems. And these tend to span across multiple disciplines. This is, of course, the rationale for using case studies. But again, case studies are often used within a particular silo, um, such as marketing or human resources, rather than addressing the situation holistically, like we find ourselves in in real life business. Now, we've already seen how stories model behavior. Um, they engage us holistically as individuals. So whereas facts and the statistics address only or engage only two parts of our brain, that's Wernicke's area and Broca's area, responsible for data and language processing, a good story well told can light up up to seven regions of the brain. So if you talk about somebody's movements in a story, the motor cortex can light up. 
Now, there's all sorts of more information about why we should be using stories in education to fix these three challenges, uh, which you can read in my book, but my time is nearly up. So I want to leave you with this one thought. Storytelling is increasingly on the curriculum of many business schools, but it's often not on the core curriculum and it's often explained rather than taught in such a way that people master it. So again, we find the same three problems that I've been talking about today, the rigor versus relevance, the explanation versus experience, and thirdly, the isolation. Um, to give you an example, I was recently teaching at a university that uh, has an executive MBA program, and I only had half a day. And the students were supposed to be able to master the art in this time. And uh, the un unanimous feedback was, first of all, we would need at least a whole day. And secondly, we should have had Jyoti's teaching at the beginning of the year rather than at the end, because then we could have put all these lessons into practice. Thank you so much for your attention. I look forward to hearing how you've been maybe overcoming some of these challenges and putting things into practice. Um, if you're interested in finding out more, do pick up my book. Do get in touch. Perhaps you're one of the few people who has been addressing these challenges and successfully implementing business storytelling across the board, in which case I would love to exchange notes with you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. You can find me on LinkedIn or write to me under joti at guptara.com. That's my first name and my last name.com.